flip going on. There will be a P for power. The device will turn off its own power if the drive looks like it hung up. It'll shut it off and you'll see P. Then there'll sometimes be a dot. Then there'll be a W for weight. And then P for power back on again. And then, so you'll see symbols like this that go through the whole thing. I don't know that they have documented all of those. I don't know if they've documented any of them. Um, and so as we see some, I'll tell you what we're doing when we're going through it. There's also one mode where you're going from a single sector, you're going from a block to a single sector. And so you'll also see sometimes a lowercase s. So you'll see things that will happen on the screen with these characters that are tracking it. But I can tell right away I'm doing a block transfer. I don't know how big the block is. I can make the block whatever size I want up to 120 something characters, something around there. They change it sometimes and so I'll have to double check and make sure it's not 140 today. But uh, So that's, your, that's what you're doing right here and, it's, and this block is being transferred in four to seven milliseconds. The whole block. So if I have 120, it's transferring it in memory across the bus to the drive that I'm writing to in destination in four to eight milliseconds now. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, so I'm gonna break the rest of the screen down so everybody can see. This is basically a sector map. So these are all individual sectors and you can highlight them with your cursor and see the content that's in them. So you can move around on the screen and st but you have to stop the imaging process to do it. And then you can start the imaging process again. And you don't have to turn off the power on the drive. You don't have to do anything. You just continue on where you want. And then there is this map. This is however big your hard drive is, they squish it into this box. So from there to there is the whole hard drive. So no matter, I mean, it's not a single sector. These are not single sectors. This could be 20 sectors. It could be 100 sectors. It could be a million sectors. It's just how big is your hard drive to fit in there? It mathematically equates a map to give you that idea, okay? And then the green boxes means I've successfully read all of these sectors. If I hadn't, there'll be some gray boxes there, there'll be some other colors there, indicating that there are sections of the drive I did not read. So that's basically giving you a map of I am successful or not successful with the whole drive. Does that make sense? So if you walk up and you glance at the screen and you had green all the way to here, then you know I got the whole hard drive. I don't even need to know. Now, even if one sector is gone, the color will change and you'll see a count right there that will possibly be another number depending on your settings because you can read a whole hard drive and have that number and miss something, not get something and still have that be zero, but it's because you set it that way on purpose. There's some reasons for that. We'll get into that, okay? The next part is logging. This part is logged and it is stored on the destination drive. So the destination drive currently, the best way, and this confuses people, all right, so on your disk, the, instead of thinking of it as a circle like this, think of it as logical space. So L, they're now LBA. Maybe there's a better way to do LBA zero. And then this is going to be logical space going down. Okay? So you're going to have sector, 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 sector. Whatever your source drive is, the one that's damaged, the one you're trying to read from, has to be written to a destination drive. The destination drive um, doesn't always have to be bigger. It has to be at least the same size. And there's an alternative that you can do, but it needs space to write this content to. So typically you just get a bigger drive. At the end, so your source drive right here, let's say it's 100 gigs, then you need the next, at least the next size up that's 4% bigger. So roughly 120 gigs would do the job, okay? So let's say this drive is 120 gigs. Right after the 100 gig mark, where the data, because this is all the data that you have on your source drive, there is no other data. The Deep Spar makes a container down here in binary and it tracks all the stuff that's going on. So down here, it's actually got uh, a table, it's called a bitmap flag, and it knows the status of every single thing that happens in your drive. So if you pull the power, every error will still have a map of every error. And every sector that's been copied, it will know every sector has been copied. And if it has been copied, it never touches it again. So if I'm on, if I'm on the deep spar, if I'm here, 
And if I'm here and I stop it and I go back to the beginning of the drive, I've got green right there and I hit F5, even if I tell it to start from that first sector, read from the first sector, image the same way I was doing from zero, it will skip all of the green. Anything that's green, it'll just fly all the way through. It never touches them. It's just getting to where I finished. And it will keep on going because it kept track of it in the map. If it's been touched, don't touch it again. Yep. So in, in the event that you're, you have a 100 gig drive and you're copying to a 100 gig drive, does it just not do the map or will it not even let you start? Well, you cannot start without a destination to write that logging to. They used to make a version, and there's a picture of it in the book I don't really talk about anymore, but there used to be a forensics version. And so the forensics version had a feature in it, but I hated the box. I mean, I, it was a $7,000 box, whatever it was. It was terrible. I hated it, though. It was a computer all built in one, and the whole thing was built in. The deep star was built in, and, but it would overheat, and I'd be on jobs, and it would overheat and die. But I had this one feature that I really loved in it. Um, on the back of the box, they had two CF cards. And so the forensics version, instead of doing it to the destination drive, would image and log to the CF card. So I begged them to add a button for the same exact thing in the deep spar and screwed. And it's my fault probably that the forensics version died on the vine, like they killed that version. So they added a forensics module to add in the things that I wanted it to happen into the, into the deep spar. So you can buy a forensics module which calculates uh, all these things that says, oh, this file's 100% copied. How many sectors did I miss of this file? Like, so there's a forensics version add-on that does those things. But one of the things they added into the standard version that I wanted is this. At the beginning, before you start imaging your drive, it really happened because at the time, you could only buy four terabyte drives, and if you wanted to image a four terabyte drive, there was nothing bigger than a four terabyte drive. So I was like, this is not acceptable. I can't image, I can't work on it at all until you guys add something. So we added the button that will allow you to select drives. Um, some, some systems say configure drive and some say select. What that does is it lets you choose a configuration drive. So you can choose your destination drive from the numbers and you can add a configuration drive. So what I do is on the motherboard, you can plug in another drive that's at least 4% of the total-ish, something in the neighborhood. So you could plug in a CF card and it will log to the CF card. And then you can take the CF card with you with all your logs on it and keep it, on your, keep it bound to the drive. So that's why I was mentioning CF stuff because you can literally plug it into your motherboard somehow and get the CF card to come up and run and then just carry around a little thing with you that has all the logging on it. Or you can just plug in another hard drive. You can just plug in, I can take a 40 gig hard drive and plug it into the chain and I can take two four terabyte hard drives, image them, and then write the logging to the 40 gig drive. Does that make sense? So that's how you do it. If there isn't, if you don't have exactly what you need. The other thing is it preserves forensics evidence. Um, so besides the fact if you only have two four terabyte drives and you need to write to two four terabyte drives or two 10 terabyte drives, whatever it is, um, my problem was this. If you sit on the stand and they ask you, hey, did you write anything else to the drive that wasn't the client's data? I mean, that's a trick question, right? Because if you're on a deep spar and you wrote to the destination drive, even after you're done, if you just took that image of the destination drive and you took the image of the partition, the original drive and the notation that you'll have for the serial numbers will say, I'm bigger. I, I, I mean, it's not, a whole, it's not a whole image at that point. You're only imaging the destination drive's data that was relative to the source drive. Does that make sense? So it can become tricky answering those questions in court. So the best way, if I really had a case that was really important like that, and I knew it, because sometimes you do know it, uh, then I would only image to the same size drives and I would write a configuration drive for everything else. Then my answer would be, no, I did not write anything else to the drive. This is all the client's data. But otherwise, my answer, I, I don't try that hard anymore. There was a day I did, but now it, I would just do it the way I normally do it. I would write it. And see, 
I'm using a data recovery system and it turns out it's the only way that this can ever be done. And so I have logging of all the steps I did. And so I wrote data that's the logging to the rest of the drive. And so I would say, so, but that's not the part you're seeing in the forensics evidence because I didn't give you the logging. So I'd tell them that. And I've also figured out if you explain things uh, correctly, honestly, in a technical fashion, lawyers will stop asking you questions because they don't know what you said. They, lawyer, there's a trick with lawyers. The, lawyer, the trick always is um, they won't ask you a question they don't know the answer to. So that means they only have a limited amount of knowledge about what it is that they're asking you a question about because somebody already sat down and went over it with them. But that means that they don't know the answer that's coming. So if your answer is highly technical, they don't even know what you said. And because they don't know the next answer to the next question, they don't ask you another one. Does that make sense? So I'm just letting you know the truth. That's the way it goes. It's, it's uh, terrible from that standpoint, but you just always be honest and thorough. And um, I mean, uh, I, I had a really funny situation once. I don't want to get too far off here, but I testified in Spain. I had to go to Spain and testify in a case. And they didn't speak English, so everybody spoke Spanish. There was almost nobody who spoke English while I was there. So I had a translator that was with me. And so at the beginning of the court proceeding, the translator comes out and he talks to you to prove that you two can carry on a conversation. So at the beginning of the thing, the translator goes, I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes and we're going to have a discussion so that the, everybody can see we know what we're discussing together. Then I would say something, then he translate it and going back and forth. So we had, had a small conversation. Judge says, okay. And then they ask a question, and it's a technical question about computer stuff. So I answered a question, and then the translator... <laughs> <laughs> he, he literally told the judge, I have no idea what he just said. <laughs> like, if he had, because computer words are computer words, and they just are computer words no matter what language that you're in. And this went on for like five minutes before, like, I'm trying to answer the question in a format he can translate it. And eventually, surprisingly, the judge goes, I speak English, I have been to America and took classes or whatever, and so I understood what you've said, so we're just going to skip this part. <laughs> so, but it's hilarious because they just don't know at this point. Anyway, so, so this has two parts to it, basically to deal with the size and to deal with legal purposes. Okay? All right. Everybody good so far? All right, so back to here. Even if I lost power, this would pick back up where it left off. I don't want to turn the power off and have to go through the whole thing. But this is really nice. Every tool that you've ever had before one of these tools typically did not do incontiguous imaging. Does that make sense? You had to start at the beginning. You had to go to the end. If it died in the process, you had to start over again. So if something bad happened, you had to hope for the best and try again. Well, on any of the data recovery equipment, it makes no difference. I can image from forward, and this is the other thing that's really important, all forensics imagers can image backwards, which is super incredibly important. There is so many times that imaging forward does not work correctly, but imaging backwards does. There's another portion of those 85% of those drives that if I just imaged them backwards, they would work. They would go much slower in the process because what happens is imaging backwards is the poor man's version of turning off memory. So here's what, how a drive works. A drive has memory on the drive. You buy them and you say, it says two megs of memory, two megs of cache, four megs of cache, 18, you know, whatever it is, 16 megs of cache, 64 megs of cache. Um, there's no 18. Um, so they have cache on the drives. They cache forward. They do not cache backwards. So if you are reading a drive and you are copying files, you're, it's, if you have 64 megs of memory on the drive, then it is 64 megs in front of where you think you are now. So when you see the cursor here, it is not here. It's 64 megs down there, even though you haven't received that data yet. It's already cached in the memory. Does that make sense, everybody? They only go forward. So they only happen when you're copying forward. So when you're normally using your drive, your drive does a couple of things. It does one thing called native command queuing. Um, it won't be important to us in data recovery to have to deal with native command queuing 
to know that it's there. But what happens is native command queuing is a piece inside firmware that reorganizes the requests that you made for files for LBA blocks, because the operating system translates that and tells it what LBA blocks it wants. It reorganizes them so that they're in order from forward to backward. So they'll go forward when they're reading them. So it's reading them, picking them up and putting them into cache, even though it's not reading them and using them now. It will give it to you in the order you requested it. Does that make sense? So the drive is trying to do a lot of things to be smart so that it can translate things to give them to you at a more rapid pace. And so it's reading forward and reorganizing all the requests you make. So you may have asked for this folder and then came over here and asked for this folder and then asked for this folder and the drive goes, well, I know where all those LBA blocks are, so I reorganized them. And now I'm reading them as I go. And then I'll give them to you as you asked for them. Okay? That makes sense. So, uh, so there's a bunch of things that are happening. If I go backwards, it turns off that cache. It's not completely off. It transfers the block and then transfers the block across the drive. So in a case like this, I could literally do this. I can literally go, um, now, there is a configuration that you have to change to tell it I want to go backwards. And I've already done one, and we'll get into configurations. I don't want to blur the line here. I'm going to show you. I'm going to go backwards. I'm going to say, execute. And there's a character. If you hit the letter M, it'll say the maximum size of the drive. So it'll be max LBA. That will be the last number. So uh, I didn't finish this breakdown of the screen because somebody asked a question. But the bottom row down here is documenting, first off, where your cursor is, how big the drive is, there's a percentage. The percentage is not the percentage that's copied. It's the percentage of where you are in respect to the total LBA. So right now, my cursor is 19% into the drive. If I hit, I can use characters just like I would if I'm editing a Word document. I can hit the end key, and it will go to the very last block on the drive. I would be at 100%. I clearly have not copied 100% of the drive, but it would say 100% right there because my character is 100% into the drive. Does that make sense? Understand? Are we okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's just a control mechanism. And then this is called, we will make up to four passes of a hard drive. So when you normally copied a hard drive, when you used your little, what's the name of the box you're using? It's <coughs> just a... Cloning dock. Clone dock or whatever, something, we'll call it that. Clone dock. When you hit the button and you said go, it went from the beginning of the drive to the end of the drive. That's all it did. If anything was wrong, it never retried anything. It never went backwards. It did not do multiple passes. It did not say, oh, I missed some stuff. I need to go back and get it. It did not do any of that. It only does beginning to the end, and it better be successful or it dies. That's not true here. Here I can do up to four passes at once. And I can say go forwards, go backwards, go to the middle of the drive. I can say all kinds of things. And so I can choose those items. Yep. So is this thing similar to the Atoma where on the first pass if it hangs up, it'll skip? Out? Yes. Uh, so the Atola and you, you, it was developed later. Um, and the Atola is very graphical in nature. By design, it had multiple passes. It also has what's called sessions. We do not have sessions here. Uh, we only have the four passes. If you had sessions, then you would have groups of four passes. Um, so the Atola has sessions. And in the sessions, it's already, well, in the passes, they're already broken up by how many sizes of blocks it's going to read, and then it will skip, and how many sectors it's going to skip if there is a problem. And the reason is, the hope is, if there's a scratch on the platter, instead of grinding on the platter trying to read this one location, I go to the good stuff. And I read all the good stuff first. And then I can come back on the other passes and I can read bad stuff. Things that cause me problems. And so that way you're not killing the drive in the process. Okay? So, and I'll get to the TOLA and how it does that, but, uh, but if you wanted to like go to the middle of the drive, you kind of have to guess where the middle of the drive is and click on it and then it moves you to that location. Whereas here, I could say a specific number or 
you know, physically at least, I can do it much quicker from that so standpoint. This one doesn't bail out because of issues in a certain like sector. It won't jump like a million LBAs ahead to try to bail out of that bad sector. Yes. It will or will not. Yes, it will. Okay. Um, it's programmable, and so a little like what you're used to dealing with at the passes, and where you've already previously designed and said, I want to jump a million sectors here. Uh, you can program exactly what it is that you want it to do. But by default, it would be a million sectors. Okay. Um, so we're going to do four different passes, and then there's a counter for passes, because you can tell passes to do more than one. Like I could say, ignore ECC, read 99 times, and then it'll count 99 times. So we'll get to that. And then speed. And then this last box right here is the slides I just covered. Your options are DMA, PIO, 48-bit, 28-bit. So right now, I'm in DMA mode, 48-bit. I can change that on the fly. So I can switch to PIO mode and 28-bit so that I could use ignore ECC as a command. And so right now, I'm at DMA, 48-bit. Okay? So you'll see this happen too. There'll be boxes that I can check that box. Um, but I was focusing on reverse. So I'm going to tell this to go backwards, and you're going to see I'm going to go from the end of the drive, and all of a sudden this map is going to start reading this way, going backwards. And so the pass that I already created to do that is called secondary. So when I hit enter now, it's down here, and it's going backwards, and it's reading data backwards. Now you'll notice the transfer rate is 8 to 10 times more than it was. Going backwards turns off all that cache. And so I'm only transferring one block at a time. And I'm in, right now, I'm in PIO mode and 48-bit. So in this pass that I made, I converted how I'm communicating with the drive. So that's why I am successful with 85% of the drives nothing else can read, is between switching to going backwards, forwards, PIO mode, 48-bit, 28-bit, uh, in UDMA and transferring different rates. So I'm switching all these on the fly all the time to the best possible choices. And there is a sweet spot that would get you the fastest of them. If a drive is damaged, you don't know what it will respond to. And so you, if you just go to PIO mode, it's really slow. It could be as much as 16 times slower than copying the drive some other way. And it's fine for a 100 gig drive but what about a 10 terabyte drive? I mean, that would be two months of work if I did it in PIO. So you have to find the sweet spot that you can control to get DMA to work the way you want it to, but it may not work at the highest level that it says it is. Does that make sense to people? So why did you switch to, why did you determine you want to switch to PIO mode backwards instead of ECMS? So the idea between the first one and the second one is that they're opposites. So the first pass would normally be as fast with all the fastest stuff turned on. The second one is meant to clean up all the stuff that it didn't get in the fastest pass. And so whatever wasn't successful, we assume, isn't going to work with the same settings. So therefore, going backwards with PIO mode is the opposite. So that um, when you start the first process and the first pass, that you can leave and go home and have dinner with your kids and enjoy your weekend and the computer is going to handle everything for you and give you the best possible scenario for Monday morning so that you didn't have to waste a lot of time. Then you can manually manipulate the rest of the stuff. So that's, that's your concept. It, is it always the best one? No. If I'm standing there and I want to do something and I want to make sure that it's faster, then I can completely do that. I can say, well, I'm going to stop this. I'm going to go to my configuration. I just don't want to make this too complicated at this point. I can go to my configuration and I can turn off PIO mode, which then will switch back to UDMA mode. It'll be the highest one possible. And then I can hit F5 and continue. And now I'm in DMA mode and you'll see that it's a lot faster than it was. So now it's still slower going backwards because it's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 3 to 16 times slower because you have no cache or the cache is fundamentally turned off. It's not actually turned off because uh, there is a hardware command to turn it off. And uh, so I'm in DMA 4 now. You can see I'm still in 48-bit and I'm in DMA mode and I'm going backwards and it's faster 
uh, by 30 milliseconds right now than it was for every block that I trained. See that little line now? It came back. How about that? So, uh, so that's what that line is telling me that it's alive. And then I can also do, just to go back to where I was, I can, I can tell it I want to do sectors just to show you what the difference looks like. And if this works the way it's supposed to work without the update, then it will switch to S. See S? So that's an S, literally. It's just going so fast as it resets each block. It's doing sector by sector. And so now it's 13 milliseconds, but I'm only transferring one sector instead of, uh, I think it was 128. They change that number from time to time depending on how much memory is available. I think it was 128 was the block size. Uh, it used to only be 120. So, so uh, forget all the stuff I just did, like all this complicated stuff that's going on. The whole point that I'm trying to give you is what your options are that can happen. So if the whole point is I can go backwards, I can go forwards, and I can switch between all of those modes I told you about, DMA, PIO, 28-bit, and 48-bit. And so the next step I would show you is that in 28-bit mode, we could program a mode to ignore ECC, and then you would see this happen, but I'm on a Toshiba. So, uh, and I'm on this Toshiba because I can also do heads, and not every drive supports head maps perfectly uh, without some extra work happening. And so I can do head maps and I can see individual heads in this process. And that does take a minute or two to run for it to do the heads, but I, I wanna show you. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start the head map and when you guys take a break, and then when we come back, it'll be done. So I'm gonna say build a head map because that, if I was gonna do some diagnostics to figure out what was going on with this drive, like it's copying stuff, but then it stops copying stuff, then it's copying stuff, my next thing would be to test heads and see what the individual heads are doing. Um, before I click this button, something that will change, which I had asked for specifically, if I first started up the drive and things weren't reading correctly, I can run a media test on the source drive. And the media test will just, you, it's just using 10,000 milliseconds and it just says, can I read anything, is it green? And so you don't know what chunk it's reading, it's not copying the chunk or anything. It's just reading to see if I can get green out of that entire chunk, okay? But this screen changes. After you do a head map, it tests all the heads individually. And then however many heads you have, you'll have rows for those. So across the media line, right, there's some of those blocks that are green that don't have check marks underneath them? Yep. Yeah. So um, at some point in time, I ran something on this drive that asked for something about the file system. And the check marks indicate that I asked for things that had file system data in it that was allocated. And so that's what the check marks are, are things that are allocated files on the file system. So this is where after like 2010 or 2011, it actually happened because of one of the guys in one of my classes. They got into the Google groups and they were talking to each other and they were like, you used to only be able to clone the whole drive. You did not have any interaction with the operating system to say, I only want the files that exist, not the deleted files. Because if you had a 500 gig drive and someone only had 28 gigs of data, why should we copy 500 gigs? So I only want the 28 gigs. So these guys um, uh, made a tool that parsed the MFT entry, said how big I was and where the sectors were, and then applied it to the DeepSpar's map. And so they made it work on their own. And DeepSpar is in the group and they saw this happen and then somehow, Next thing you know, they wrote this piece that does it and gave it as part of the updates for free that it automatically parses the logical file system. And now you can say, only give me allocated or only you know, ignore the unallocated. Because in data recovery, unlike forensics, the only thing a client really wanted was the files they already had. They're not concerned about deleted files. It's super rare. That's just gonna be logical stuff. My cat ran across the keyboard and deleted my book about cats dot doc, right? Now I need to find that file. That's a logical recovery. The cat knocked my laptop off of the table and now my drive is dead and I want my cat dot doc file back. I just wanted the allocated stuff that I already had, not the deleted stuff. Does that make sense? So if you're trying to be fast and you just, you know, the guy needs payroll tomorrow at noon or you don't get paid, 
then only do the allocated stuff. You can even get better than that. You can be specific about what you want. But the whole point being the allocated stuff is the meat and potatoes of what people really want. They don't want the unallocated data. Forensics people want unallocated data. Does that make sense? So is that still technically a physical copy of the logical, like the stuff that's... Yes. Okay. It is physical. Everything that the deep smart does is physical, but applying the logical piece to the physical, which the PC3000 is always done. The PC3000 is the one tool that always parsed data as long as I've ever known it for 20 years. Uh, it's always parsed logical data and gave it to you if you bought the DE function. So there was a, there was a $2,000 add-on to the tool, which is now supposed, I mean, nobody buys it without those two real, normally most of the time, but, uh, but you are buying it as a separate piece. But it did, it was the only tool I ever knew of that ever did it until the DeepSpark comes along and then the Atola added it. So the Atola has it now as well. So, okay. Everybody good so far. So now I'm going to start this other function. We take our break. And then when we come back, we'll talk about head maps on this function. Okay. Everybody good? <laughs>